Lovely to see you tonight. Nan's having a wee smile up at me. She sees this place. It's like wallpaper up here. There's that many papers about. But it's lovely to see you, and we are depending upon the Spirit of God just to bring forth what he wants to bring forth for this meeting this evening. And we're turning to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, please. Now, I know that I was looking at these first verses in Hebrews chapter 1 on Sunday evening in a special way with special emphasis on the gospel. I just want to look at it tonight as believers from some different angles because I believe that these verses have impressed themselves on my heart and have become very special to me. You know, when you hear somebody standing up and they say, well, turn to the book of Hebrews, your mind automatically says, oh, not Hebrews. I mean, I can't really get into Hebrews. Hebrews seems to be for the professors. It seems to be beyond me. And uh, everybody starts talking about what the whole book teaches before they get to the first verse. And George Bates will be as guilty as anybody else in some ways. But you know, it happens. They talk about the warnings of the book of Hebrews, and they take you through all the different regions of the book of Hebrews, and before they get to the first verse, you're so, so confused with the whole thing, thank you, John, that you're not sure whether you'll be able to understand it or not. Well, we want to be as simple as we can possibly be as we look at these verses together, just to... Uh, cream off, as it were, some of the things that I've been thinking about as I've been thinking about this meeting, because my mind is so full of so many things. Liz says to me on the way out, she says, remember, half this week and half next week, you know, they're used to me up in the house, and so I have to be very careful and make sure that I don't overdo it. But it's Hebrews chapter 1, and just let's take a moment or two on these verses, these first four verses. We'll read them first of all so that we have uh, a sense of what they're saying. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by Son. The word his, of course, is in italics because it's not there in the original whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, as far as Hebrews chapter 1 is concerned, I don't know whether I'll get all those verses over before the time is gone or not, but we want to simply see what God's Word has to say to us. You see, we can see in the very first word that our eyes are turned upon God. Not upon anybody or anything else. And how in these days we need to get our eyes steadfastly fixed on God. You need to get your eyes off gurus. And you need to get your eyes off great preachers and big churches and systems that attract you, and even from, as it were, those things that call back at us from the past. We need to keep our eyes upon God. We need to bring God into everything in our lives. We need to say, what would God think of this? Where is God in this? Am I going off on my own charges, or is it God that's working in me? both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Is it God in the beginning? Because if it's God in the beginning, it'll be God the whole way through. 
If it's me in the beginning or you in the beginning, then you'll have to prop it up from beginning to end. Make sure that everything that has a beginning is God in the beginning. As it says in the very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning God, and you can be sure that what God plants will grow. God, God, who at sundry times, that word sundry means many parts, different times, in different ways. It says here, God who at sundry times and in various manners or diverse manners, speak in time past unto the fathers. Of course, he's talking to the Hebrews here. And so he's talking about their forefathers. By the prophets, God spoke unto the fathers, by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by son. Who was this epistle written to? Well, the book was written first and foremost for those to whom it was addressed, the Hebrews. It's written to the Hebrews. The first century Hebrews. The Hebrews who were actually living before Titus came in with his Roman army in 70 AD. And the blood of the Jews ran knee deep as every tree was occupied with a crucified Jew. This book was written first and foremost for them, but child of God, it has a message that's so relevant and so pertinent and so appropriate and so applicable for us tonight that it's vital that we don't ignore it. Because we would lose so much and it would be to our own spiritual detriment if we ignore this book. Don't ignore the book of Hebrews. It addresses itself to the very same trials and experiences that so many Christians are going through today. It does more than that. It shuts the mouths of the heretics who deny the pre-existence and the deity of Christ. And we're surrounded by them today, even in our own land and on our own doorstep. It sets forth clearly the perfect deity and the sinless humanity combined in the holy, unique personality of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. You can't miss it. You would need to be a fool to read the book of Hebrews and not know that he is perfect man and perfect God. It exposes the sham of ritualistic ceremonial traditions that cling to mere shadow now when the substance himself has come forth. Why would we cling to shadows when God has given us the very substance? He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. In a day of political change and religious turmoil and confusion, this letter reveals a rest for the people of God. Listen, there's a rest for you, child of God. There's a rest for me. If it's God in the beginning, you can be sure you'll have God's rest all night. This book teaches the rest for the people of God. And at a time when the establishment is falling apart and Rome seems to be overpowering the systems that resist her, this message assures the true church of Christ that we have unrestricted access to the presence of Almighty God himself to obtain mercy and to find grace to help in time of need. What a friend we have in Jesus. We don't need religious systems. No, no. The religious systems are toppling all around us. Men who have set themselves up as the leaders of the religious systems are groveling at the Pope's feet. But hallelujah, we can come to Christ's feet. He's only a prayer away. We can come to God. We have unrestricted access at any time of the day or night. God. Oh, may the Lord keep our eyes on God. Yes, we can see here 
who the epistle was written to. And of course, you could write volumes about that one question. Some have. But who wrote this epistle? I have no doubt in my own mind that Paul the Apostle was the human instrument used to write this letter. I've never had anything else in my head from the moment I first read it. You know, you'll find that this epistle ends with a personal greeting. Now that the doctrines have all been set forth and their applications have been led in order before us, the writer to the Hebrews concludes with a personal greeting. And I'll tell you something else he does. He asks for personal prayer. Only Paul did that. It was Paul who was always asking, would you pray for me that I might have utterance? He knew that he couldn't rely on his own thoughts or his own ideas. It had to be God. He realized it so much he was always asking the people of God, look, pray for me that God will do this thing, that I might have utterance. Indeed, the writer is in prison, it seems, from chapter 13, verse 18 and 19, and he makes mention of Timothy at the same place, who was Paul's son in the faith and fellow worker and fellow traveler on his missionary journeys. Timothy. Then we haven't only got that lovely little greeting with all those things threaded into it at the end of the book of Hebrews, but even Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, let's just turn for a second to 2 Peter chapter 3 and see what Peter says, just a couple of books down there from where you are, keeping your place in Hebrews 1. He says here, having talked to us in chapter 3 of Second Peter, of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Peter says in verse 13, nevertheless, we, we believers, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, he says in verse 14, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, give priority to this, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul. I love the way Peter says that. Paul and Peter were good friends, you know. Even though there came a time when Paul had to withstand Peter to the face because he was slipping. He was letting things slip. He was slipping back to the old Judaistic ways. Hi, but they're friends, they're brothers, they're fellow apostles. He says, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, he recognized that God had given unto Paul wisdom. He says, according to the wisdom given, given unto him, hath written unto you. You see, Peter's writing to the Hebrews here at this time. And if the epistle to the Hebrews is not the letter that he's referring to just now, then we don't know where it is. That's the truth. It's gone. It's got to be the book of Hebrews. He says, Paul wrote to you, Hebrews, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. You see, Paul recognizes the writings of Paul as being the Scriptures. Sometime you might need to know that. I remember being in Scotland for the first time. Sister Emma Greenwood took us over, or we wouldn't have been there. Paid for the whole thing, took us on holiday. Kids were only small at the time, just tiny. And I remember... Whenever I started to talk to people, they would say to me, but that's old Paul. That's only Paul. 
We don't recognize him. We don't want nothing to do with Paul. It's Jesus you see we're following. I would say, you know, you women haven't got your head covered. Fuck, you're took up. We old Paul, that's what you're took up with. And there they would all come off with this same old statement. Listen, Paul wrote 14 epistles in your New Testament, and if you take them out, you're not left with much, are you? Come on, they can just take out 14 epistles by saying, that's old Paul. It's the Scriptures, dear. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. And we need to remember that. And so we can see here that Peter the Apostle makes it clear that Paul did write scriptures to the Hebrews. And as I've said, if this letter that we're reading tonight is not the scriptures that he's referring to, then where would we go to find it? Now, I know that Paul always began by signing his letters, but he was primarily the apostle to the Gentiles. And if he had written his name to this letter to the Hebrews, his fellow Hebrews, then some of them wouldn't even have read it because they didn't think he should be going to the Gentiles at all. There was all sorts of misunderstandings between the Hebrews in Jerusalem and the Apostle Paul because he was coming to the Gentiles at all. And so if he had put his name to the beginning of this letter, they would have just thrown it out of court right away. Again, I remind you that in most of his epistles, the Apostle Paul was establishing his apostleship by signing at the beginning of the letter, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Because there were those who were saying, he wasn't an apostle. He wasn't an apostle at all. Well, he just affirmed. And he was contending for his apostleship by signing his name at the start and saying, an apostle of Jesus Christ, not by the will of men, but of God. But you see here, in this letter, he's not contending his apostleship. Indeed, it's Christ's divine apostleship that he speaks about in chapter 3 and verse 1. That's what's before him. He has our eyes on God. There are many other, other things that I could say, but I don't want to get involved in all that stuff because I've already criticized others who do it. And I don't want to fall into the trap of doing it myself. You have to say something, don't you? Who was this epistle written to? Well, we can see it was written to the Hebrews. Who wrote it? Well, you can believe what you like. I personally believe that it was the Apostle Paul. It's not the important thing. You see, that's why the writer has her eyes on God and not on the writer right away. It's God's Word. But why was it written at all? Remember that for hundreds of years now, all Jewish life had focused around the temple on the top of Mount Moriah and its traditions and its ritual and its sacrifices and its offerings and the trumpets would sound and the people would be called from every direction and out they would come in their thousands into the temple. It was a center of Jewish life. And we can see from the arguments of this letter that the temple was still standing and that the whole sacrificial system was in normal operation at the time of the writing of this letter, even though the, the great veil had been torn apart by unseen hands at the death of Christ. Still, they were back there offering their sacrifices. So obviously, as I've said earlier, it was written before Titus and his Roman armies destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Now, at this time, if a Hebrew trusted Jesus Christ as their own and personal Savior and Lord, and if that Hebrew was publicly baptized by immersion, then doing so, he or she immediately severed themselves from the privileges that they had previously enjoyed as a citizen of the commonwealth and nation of Israel. The moment you stepped out and Christ was your Lord... And you were not ashamed to call him Lord. Then as far as the Jews were concerned, you died. They just had a funeral and you didn't exist anymore. I have sat in Jerusalem, breaking bread with hundreds of 
born again Hebrew brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's wonderful. There's a church in Jerusalem today, and everyone in it is a born again Hebrew. Isn't that exciting? And I've sat there as the traditional Jews, the rabbis, have come by with their ringlets hanging underneath their black hats and they're spatting and they've gnashed their teeth and you can see the hatred on their face. And I'll tell you this, there's a boy and he's whooping them up, an apostate evangelist, Jewish, is whooping them up and telling them lies and telling them that Christians are seeking to uh, commit spiritual genocide and get rid of all the Jews. And they're being whooped up. And the spirit, the same spirit that stoned Stephen to death is raising its head in Israel today. Raising its head. Yes. And in those days, let me tell you, friend, they had murder in their heart when they were bouncing the boulders off Stephen's head. And that was only the beginning. And if you stepped out and professed the name of Christ, listen, you automatically lost all social, political, educational, economic rights in your community. You couldn't send your children to the rabbi to be educated if you're going to call Jesus Christ Lord. It cost them everything to follow Jesus. Everything. Cost us nothing. And we can't do it. Sad, isn't it? They knew their God, you see. They were doing great exploits for God in those early days. There's evidence in this letter to support the belief that it was written originally to converted Jews in the very region of Jerusalem. I'm not going to start and go through chapter 6, verse 10, chapter 10, verse 32, chapter 13, verse 7, chapter 13, verse 17 to 24. We haven't time for that. But there is evidence there that this was actually written not to Jews scattered, but to Jews living in the very vicinity of Jerusalem, under the very shadow of the temple. We can see from Acts chapter 3 and verse 1 that Peter and John were going up into the temple together at the hour of prayer. Do you have an hour of prayer? They were going in at the hour of prayer. Well, it was the ninth hour. They even had it worked out for them, you see. That was the ninth hour. And they were going up at 3 p.m. into the temple at the hour of prayer. And the rest of the believers were meeting with them every day with one accord in the temple, we're told. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46. They were all there at Solomon's porch. I can take you to the spot where they were meeting, kids and all. I was nearly going to say dummy tits in the lot, but they hadn't dummy tits in them days. I'm sure there was a bit of squealing and yelling and crying going on at times. didn't disturb the boys. They preached away. They met with one accord in the temple. What were they doing in the temple? Why were they praying in the temple? Well, you see, it took a while for the first Christians to realize the full import of what was involved in their acceptance of Christ. But this letter is being read by second-generation Christians. God who at sundry times and in divers manners speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. There's second-generation Christians here, and we're almost into 70 AD. The whole thing's coming down. Oh, well, there's a whole bluff still going on. It's not of God at all. All the pomp and ceremony is still existing at this moment. And these second generation Christians, they know that the final severance from Judaism became necessary and it brought with it sore and bitter persecution and it brought trials and it brought afflictions. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. God, take it to the Lord. Prayer. Suffering and death 
in the early days were welcomed and rejoiced in. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ. Oh, but the old joy isn't so obvious now as numbers have decreased and many of the great stalwarts of faith have passed on and many of them been martyred. Many of them been scattered. It's a different world. And this letter was to bring the Hebrews to realize that Jesus Christ was not an enemy of the law. He was not a new religion. And he wasn't condemning the things that they loved. He had fulfilled all the types and shadows and sacrifices by his one great offering for sin forever in perfect harmony with everything that had gone before. You see, they had a divine religion before the Lord Jesus Christ was born of Mary. Everything that they were practicing, it was God who gave them it. Well, not everything, but all those things that were written. And that's why Paul starts here by showing that he's no quarrel with the prophets. He's revealing, nevertheless, that Christ was better than angels. That he had a better covenant, that, that, that there was a better substance, a better sacrifice, better promises, better hope, better resurrection. Listen, we're going to a better country. It's something far better than an old temple no matter who built it or how magnificent it is. Something far better than that. You see, he knew, Paul knew, that they were being reviled and persecuted and killed for Christ's sake. Don't think there's anybody doing that with us just yet. But they had neighbors who lost their lives rather than deny the name of Christ. I was over in Scotland recently taking meetings over there and went up one day away across the rolling hills and the marshy land and the purple heather, way over to a lonely grave. John Brown was his name. And the king's men came to that little crofter's cottage and, and pulled him out and, and he said, would you mind if I pray for a moment before you shoot? Hurry up, Wolf. Well, he started to pray for them. Started to pray for his persecutors, the very men that were going to shoot. And he could see, this officer could see that the men were softening. He said, enough of this. Enough of this praying. Shoot him. Wouldn't shoot him. Couldn't shoot him. So the officer, he grabbed the gun and he shot him. John Brown died. His wee wife was weeping hanging over him. He says, what do you think of your great covenanter now? She says, I think muckle more of him than I ever did before. I think muckle more. That means I think abundantly much more than I ever thought of him before. I was over at the grave. What a powerful time. Away over there, it was a miracle that we found it at all. It was all marked with white sticks and stones and one thing or another. We never would have found it. And I had a guide as well. But I'll tell you, there's at that spot we wept and broke our hearts before God. That God would touch us with something of the spirit of this man. Where are we, children of God? God doesn't answer my prayer. I'm not having anything more to do with him. Is that where the Christians are today? If he doesn't do it the way I want it done, then I'm finished with him. It's ridiculous, isn't it? that such an attitude would prevail in our hearts. If Mrs. So-and-so says anything about me behind my back, I'll never be back. Do you know, sometimes I wonder where we are. These people watch their blood pumping and ebbing from their bodies rather than deny Christ. Where would I be? God alone knows. If I was to start to try and figure it out, friend, I would think I'd be in the wrong place, but he giveth more grace. And we'd just have to trust him at that moment. Yes, Paul knew, or the writer, if you like, knew that they were being persecuted, they were being killed, they were having their jobs and their homes taken from them. He knew there was comfort in staying with the old religion. He knew 
that? They weren't coming out. Come out? Are you kidding? Come out to what? Come out to that? Friend, there's some of us in this land today won't even come out of old modernistic churches whenever we get saved by the grace of God. When God says, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean and I will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters. Listen, Paul warns us of men in these last days from whom we've got to turn away. He said, but my mommy and daddy went there. My sister goes there. Child of God, if God says come out, then it's the best thing you can do for the family and loved ones to give them an example. And maybe they'll follow your footsteps. If you're following Christ, get out. Yes, he knew there was a comfort in staying with the old religion. Some of them were even in danger of going back into Judaism, having already come out of it. Oh, that would be a predicament, wouldn't it? If God had given you light, if God had brought you out of the systems, if God had seen you coming rejoicing and being baptized and, 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 and witnessing to the people, and then the next thing you're coming crawling back into it again, that would be a carry-on, wouldn't it? That would be an awful thing. But in their day, you can see where they were. And nevertheless, the Lord Jesus Christ says, remember Lot's wife. I, I didn't say that. But the Savior says, remember. You could forget her, you know. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That's what Christ says, you know. He just says, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. And that was it. The boy just had to stand there. I sometimes wonder, is our thinking according to the Bible at times? Do we think we can go back whenever we feel like it? Get our hump up? And we don't have to come and get right with God again. We would need to be we would need to be in that place of confession, wouldn't we? That our brother Derek Young was talking about the other week if we were into things like this. I trust and believe that you're not. Of course you're not. But you know the spirit in which I'm speaking. I'm just trying to minister the word. I'm, I'm feeling the word. I'm seeking to bring it out. I want God to talk through me. If, if he can, if he will. That there might be a message for somebody, if not here tonight maybe even listening to the tape somewhere all I know is it says this that God who at different times and in different or various manners speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets child of God that's wonderful that's wonderful God speak our God talks. The gods of the heathens are silent and dead. And they're coming and they're worshipping and offering their oblations. Praise God he talks to his children. Praise God he loves you. How could a loving, merciful God comfort his children, bless his children, encourage his children, exhort his children if he didn't talk? I'm glad we have a God that talks. God speak. And that's why I'm looking to God to speak. He's been speaking to my heart, even as we read the word and studied it this week. God who at sundry times and in divers' manners speak in time pass unto the fathers by the prophets. You know, just for the sake of the young converts, let me say, I think it's W.E. Vine makes it clear that although prophets in God's word, they predicted things, they foretold things. That's not always the meaning of the word, you know, especially in the New Testament. It's not a foretelling, but a forthtelling. And that's in there too, in the word prophets. 
And we've got to remember that. This same God who spoke to the fathers through the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Or if you take that word in italics out, the word that men have put in there, by Son. You see, because we have a wrong impression in our mind if we think, for example, isn't it at the end of Matthew's gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ tells that parable of, of, of the the husbandman letting out his vineyard, and, and then uh, he sent servants to come to, to, to get what was due to him, and they beat them, and, and they persecuted them, and they killed some of them. And then he sent his son. Well, you see, if you're just sort of thinking that that's all that's here, that's there, of course it's there. But that's not all that's there, because God is not just sending a message communicated by his own son. It's God the Son that's doing the talking here. It's God himself manifest in flesh. God in his sonship. This is God talking. God's not sending somebody else a message. But he's talking in his Son. Our Lord Jesus Christ is God. He is alive. He is present in this meeting just now. He knows where we are. He knows that some of us, we have been reproached for Christ's sake. He knows that some of us aren't getting it easy with the people at work who have no time for your God and no time for your meetings. And if you won't work overtime, you'll be out in your neck. He knows that the world is no time for your Savior. But the Lord Jesus Christ says to you, child of God, look, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And what's happening to you is only an evidence of it. Because if you were of the world, the world would love you. Man, they're begun up the street with you on their shoulders singing, he's a jolly good fellow. But because the world hates me and because I have chosen you out of it, that's why they hate you. So you be encouraged. You be encouraged. It's only because you're different. It's an evidence of your very salvation. Ah, the Lord says, I chose you. And let this be a token to remind you of it. That's why the world's hating you. Yes, every word that we have here, it's God breathed. We see that the Lord Jesus Christ is God's last word to mankind. We went into that on Sunday night. I don't want to go into that again. He embodies the entire Old Testament revelation of God's truth, and at the same time, he radiates the complete New Testament presentation of God's truth. He's the whole Bible in one glance, God, turn your eyes upon Jesus. I put it this way because, you see, I had a whole lot of different headings that I, I had sorted out for Sunday night on this very passage. So I couldn't come back with the same headings again. I couldn't do that. But I've been thinking about this, you see, and I see it this way. He's the personifier, if I can coin a word. He's the personifier of the mind of God. That's what he is. He personifies everything in God's mind and heart. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Yes. His humanity communicates deity to mankind. When we look at Jesus Christ, our Savior, we see the personification all that God has. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yes, he's the personifier. God has spoken to us. In these last days, by his son, there's no cults. As we were saying on Sunday night, there's no late additions. We have to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered. The Lord has told us that he only will talk from this point on, through his son. So don't be looking for some Mormon or something, because it's not there. It's not there. 
Yes, but it says here, you see, that God has spoken through him and unto us by him, by whom he hath appointed heir of all things. He's not only the personifier of the mind of God, he's the possessor of the dominions of God. The possessor. He's heir of all things. It's his by inheritance. And we could go now, if we had more time, to Psalm 2, and we could look at the whole thing, but we're not going to do that. We're touching here on the Messiah and on the things that will take place when he comes back to the earth again. The kings of the earth are in for a shock when the king of kings comes. I tell you, he's the possessor of the dominions of God. He's heir of all things. How oh, when you say if he's heir, then he won't inherit what he's heir of until his father's dead. And his father can't die, so he'll never be in the good of it. Nonsense. He's appointed heir. That's his now. God has already given it all to him. And we read in John chapter 13 that all things were given into his hands by the Father. It's all his already. He's appointed heir of all things. Doesn't have to wait till the Father dies. That would never happen. God cannot die. He's God. But Christ is already in possession of the dominions of God. Listen, he's not only the personifier of the mind of God and the possessor of the dominions of God, he's the producer of the creation of God. It says, by whom also he made the worlds. He made the worlds. He made the ages. He's the father of eternity. All the ages spring from him. You see, this word worlds can be translated ages just as easily. Ah, but we know that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Listen, he's father. He's God of time and eternity. Ah, he's God of all. Even those rolling spheres that we were looking at. You know, I often think about this when I'm walking around the forest and talking to the Lord. That this wee planet I'm walking on and I'm looking up at the sky now, it's turning round at 18 and a half miles a second. I can only see a wee tiny bit of it. There are millions and millions and millions of miles of it I'll never see. And 65 and a quarter days every year. And then there's the moon and it's going round the earth. The whole thing's like a big clock as you see Uranus and Mars and Jupiter. And as you go out and see Mercury and all the different planets and stars and satellites in our galaxy. Ah, but if you step back a wee bit, you can't even see them. They're gone. You have a whole big mass of the Milky Way. Just a mass of stars. If you had a photograph, you'd have to put an arrow and say, our galaxy is somewhere around here. Powerful, isn't it? And then if you step back a wee bit more, you can see the whole universe is turning, friend. And it's taken 200 million years, this Milky Way that we're in. 200 million years just to do one rotation. It's spinning like a firework, one of those pinwheels, but it takes 200 million years to do one spin. Just one. And the Word of God says, concerning my Savior, by whom he made the worlds. That's the one who made them. With his very fingers. Yes. He's the personifier of the mind of God. He's the possessor of the dominions of God. He's the producer of the creation of God. He's the portrayer of the essential being of God. We read, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image 
of his person. You see, there's two things there, isn't that right? We saw the other night, and I just want to touch it, that he's got to be God if he's the very brightness of God's glory. Because he has the same divine, essential being. When Moses' face shone, he just reflected the glory of God. Christ isn't reflecting the glory of God. He radiates. He imparts. He's the effulgence of the glory of God. He is the true Shekinah. That's who he is. The true Shekinah. You know, the Jews, they knew about the Shekinah in the tabernacle in the temple. Ah, oh, but here's the true Shekinah. Can you see him? Can you see God's glory emanating from him? Oh, friend, I, I, I just can't get my eyes off Jesus Christ. That's, that's my problem tonight. I can't get my eyes off. But sure, is not where we're supposed to be. Isn't that why the old hymn says, turn your eyes upon Jesus? Do you remember him on the Mount of Transfiguration? It was a night scene. It was dark. And suddenly, his face shone like the sun. And his glory started to burst through. What a moment that was. I needn't get into that or over here all night. I've got to wind down now. But I just want you to see that he is the portrayer of the essential being of God. Aye, but he's not only God, he's man. He's also the visible image of the invisible son. He's the express image of his person. The word is as if you were to take a seal and press it on the wax or, or, or the, the dye that a printer uses to make the imprint on the page. We can see that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He said to Philip, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, the God-man, the sinless virgin-born Son of the living God, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, heal, incarnate deity. That's who we're talking about. Yes, he's the personifier of the mind of God, the possessor of the dominions of God, the producer of the creation of God. He's the portrayer of the essential being of God. He's the power that upholds the universal kingdom of God. We are told in verse 3, and upholding all things by the word of his power. He keeps everything in order, you know. Everything in the entire universe in constant movement. There he is. Christ's power is maintaining it in harmony, carrying out its development. Ah, but listen. Do you see all those things? Not one of them is the primary reason for why God sent his son. Not one of them is the primary reason why he came. But we're told when he had by himself purged our sins. Listen, that's the climax. Oh, that thrills me, friend. You say, well, then why did he go into all that other stuff? To show you the greatness. To show you the one that was who put away your sins. Who bore away your sins in his own body on the tree and carried them into land uninhabited and didn't brush them under the carpet but paid for them in full and they're gone tonight. Rejoice in a child of God. It was God that did it. And he did a good job. Hallelujah. See, it's the greatness of God that he's seeking. Look, he's just come from creation to Calvary in one sentence. But he wants you to see it was no wee fellow, if I can say it reverently, that died outside the city walls. He wants you to see exactly who it was. Yes. He's the purifier of the people of God. And if the one that we've been reading about tonight has purified you and made you the righteousness of God in him, I'll tell you this, you can't be any more righteous than you are in the sight of God. You're in Christ. That's wonderful. Oh, you say, but I've let him down. Take it to the Lord in prayer, dear. You're in Christ. 
payment God will not twice demand. First at my bleeding surety's hand, and then again at mine. When he had by himself, didn't send an angel, didn't send a battalion of angels, didn't send Michael the archangel, or Gabriel the herald angel, did it himself. See those sins? How you remember them, don't you? And you know them even today. Gross sins, heinous sins, unspeakable sins. Purge them all away. You're, you're free to it. You couldn't be cleaner if Christ has purified you. You're pure in the sight of God. Rejoice in it. The world and the flesh and the devil wouldn't want you rejoicing in that truth. But that's the truth that we're being taught here. When he had by himself purged our sins. And listen, it's not only our sins, but I think it's Mr. Darby and uh, the AV brought it out that he, he also died for the sins of the world, remember. He's the savior of the world. But we're just looking at it from where we are right now, and we're enjoying the fact that he purged our sins. He sat down on the right hand of his majesty on high. Listen, he's the preeminent son on the throne of God tonight. He sat down. No priest ever sat down in the temple because the work was never finished. But when John the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus, he said, Behold, here's a lamb, the lamb of God, that's going to take away the sin of the world. That's what we're trying to get at here tonight. My sins are gone. As far removed as darkness is from dawn, in the sea of his forgetfulness. That's where God has put them. There's no judgment for you and I in Christ. Praise God, our sins are gone. And listen, he's the preeminent son on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels. I can't get into that tonight. As he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, does that mean that he hadn't a more excellent name than they before he inherited it. You see, you've got to always remember that we're looking at Christ's dual, oh, what way can I say it? His dual nature, for the want of a better expression. The fact that he's God. Listen, when the Lord Jesus Christ says, my father is greater than I, he's speaking in respect of his manhood. But when he says, I and my father are one, co-equal, co-eternal, co-creative, co-existent. Then he's speaking with regard to his deity. And when we see the Son receiving by inheritance a more excellent name than they, we're talking about his very manhood. Because all that Christ in his deity is, he has become in his humanity wonderful, if only it would grasp our soul tonight. Child of God, I have so many things that I want to say. It's a quarter past nine. Let me read you a wee verse, and if you hear it again, you'll not blame me on it. Sure you won't. Come here, a wee verse, and I'll let you go. It's found in John chapter 8, because I might end up preaching the gospel on Sunday night. <laughs> Never mind Jim Paddle. You wouldn't know who'll be preaching the gospel on Sunday night. I thought it was Jimmy. But it's going to be Ronnie. And it'll either be, if it's not Ronnie, then Jim's going to do it. And if he goes down like a skittle, then it'll be me, won't it? And so, right. Uh, but you'll not blame me. Let me just read this one verse, and then we'll, we'll close, because there's not time to go on any further. The Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 30, he's talking to these Pharisees who are attacking him. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Of course, we know it wasn't saving faith that they had. They were beginning to intellectually believe that he just might be who he says he is, the Messiah. 
But we see in a few verses later, they're taking up stones to stone him to death. They weren't saved. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. You see, they're not his disciples just yet. And those who continue in Christ's words, and put Christ's words into shoe leather by faith in a practical way in their lives, as their belief determines their behavior. They're not doing it to be saved, but because they are saved. It's not a condition of salvation. He's not saying, if you continue in my word, then because you're continuing in my word, you'll, you'll eventually become a Christian. No, no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying it's an evidence of it. If you're saved, then people will see the change in your life. And he says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Never underestimate the emancipating power of God's word, because it's God's word that has emancipated us. They answered him, we be Abram's seed, and we're never in bondage to any. Who are you calling a slave? We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the slave of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son. That's the one we've been talking about all night. The son. Who's the son? Do you know what they said here in this, a few verses back in verse 25? They said, Who art thou? Oh, friend, can you see them? They're turning to the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to them, telling them, you're from beneath, I'm from above. They're turning around and they're looking into his eyes and saying, who are you? Who are you? He's the son. He's the one that we've been looking at tonight. And he says in verse 36, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And listen, child of God, go out that door tonight knowing you couldn't be more free. You couldn't be more free. Because the Son has made you free.